Welcome to the Muskoka Bible Center YouTube channel. We trust that this resource will be an encouragement to you as you grow in your faith. Bible teaching is at the core of what we do here at Muskoka Bible Center. So enjoy this sermon series. What a joy it is to have life and breath and Jesus. Amen. I once heard somebody say years ago that he needed to say something before he spoke. <laughs> I need to do that this morning. And it's this. Uh, we're speaking on family matters through this week. And obviously, uh, the scriptures on this subject focus primarily on parents and grandparents, if I search through all of the scriptures, when we're talking about family. But we have many iterations of family. In fact, about seven months ago with our staff team at Scripture Union, we went through a little exercise. We got together in small groups in our boardroom, and we said, let's try and brainstorm how many different types of families there are in terms of how they get put together and so on. We came up with over 30 different kinds. Some of those not biblically based, like same sex uh, families uh, and so on. But we recognize that there are many different types of family. We also recognize that our primary focus, particularly in North American culture, is is more on independent units. Uh, and we don't tend to think very well about the extended family. Now, part of my culture is African, and we very much get the whole idea of uncles and aunts, and in fact, everybody else in the village, they're all part of the family. I need to say that because I... As I speak to you through the course of this week, there will be some of you in the audience here who, who might be an uncle to children who never married and hasn't had children of your own. And yet you'll hear me often speaking about children and their parents and so on. I don't want to exclude you in any way. And I get concerned that... Uh, that we would not be inclusive in the best sense that Christ welcomes all of us. So I want to say that as well. I also want to say that as I chat, I will, I will primarily continue to use the language of parents and grandparents and children. But please do some interpretive work yourself. Extend it into your reality. Recognize that I can't every time I am talking, say, and I'm just speaking now to single mothers or whatever the case might be. Okay? Good. So this morning, we are going to look at building a Christian home. And I want to start by sharing a few statistics with you. I am a researcher, amongst other things, and I recently came across a very interesting statistic, and it's this. The average Christian child or youth in North America attends a church service 1.7 times a month. That's our statistic at this stage of what's happening in the church in North America. Add that up, that's 24 times in the year. Our average encounter with that child or youth is about an hour. So the average child or youth gets 24 hours in the year connecting in a church environment with the community of faith. That's not much. Anyone who knows anything about children's faith formation would agree that it's impossible to establish a child's confidence or trust in God in only one day a year. 
if this is what we were relying on. Yet the strategy of most parents, of most parents, is to entrust their children's faith formation to the church. Hmm. And the strategy of many local churches is to try and do it. Hmm. With only one day in a year, common sense says it's impossible for a local church to disciple the next generation. Here's another statistic. The average parent, Christian or not, has 3,000 hours a year interacting with their children. If we could get the next slide up, you'll see a lovely illustration here. So that's a tube filled with orange balls representing 3,000 hours a year that the parent has compared to the 24 little orange balls in the jar next to that. In other words, your average parent interacts meaningfully with their child 125 days out of the year. That's actually really good news. That's fantastic. But what I want to bring to you this morning is the recognition that the potential of 3,000 hours of faith formation in the home versus 24 hours in the church is a staggering disparity. Parents, God's plan is for you to nurture your children's faith. You can't outsource the discipling of your children to the local church or the Christian school. At best, a local church or Christian school can only supplement what you do at home. The primary responsibility for cultivating the image of Jesus in your children and helping them live their lives according to a biblical worldview rests with the Christian parent. What I'm saying is hugely important based on another report called the Q Parent Report that was undertaken just before COVID, just a couple of years back, where they analyzed the values of Christian parents and secular parents, and they discovered that they had the same set of values except for the fact that Christian parents had faith formation of their children ranked at number four, not at number one. Let's explore this further. If you've got your Bible with you, your phone app, your printed Bible, open up to the book of Proverbs chapter 24, and verses 3 to 4. Proverbs 24, verse 3 to 4, it's on the screen uh, in the ESV version. I'm going to say it again, I will say this every time I preach. My words are simply a commentary on God's Word. This Word, this Word that we are reading now, this is the inspired Word of God. This is the Word that transforms lives. This is the Word that gives us hope and purpose and life. So when we read it, listen up because we're hearing from God Himself. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. 
By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Let me, let me read it again. By wisdom, a house is built. And by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all pre precious and pleasant riches. Lord, as we open your word now and as we, as we dig into it, we hope and pray and trust, Lord, that you will imprint this word into our hearts and lives now. Lord, probably all of us have enjoyed a lovely breakfast. I can still taste that good bacon. But now we're looking to you for spiritual food and asking you to nourish us this morning from your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So let's unpack the meaning of this proverb. Dad with the little, uh, little child there, this is absolutely cool with me. There's nothing better than the sound of kids in church for me. So we can all get along okay. Don't feel you've got to run off, Dad. Just cruise around at the back there. This is all cool. So let's, let's look at the text here. The Hebrew word for house is the word bayit, and it has a wide range of definitions, including concrete spaces and abstract concepts. And taken literally, it could be a reference to a building, but within the context of its use in other portions of the Scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, it could also mean a family or the nation of Israel. And for our purposes today, I want to interpret this proverb in a, in a few minutes. I'm going to give you my paraphrase of this proverb. But I want to interpret this proverb with the understanding that bayit means family. So that's the first thing. And the second thing I want you to note in the proverb are, are three key verbs. I used to tell my children, uh, again, when I was teaching them to preach and teach, when you do biblical interpretation, pay attention to the verbs. So, three key verbs, is built, is established, are filled. Is built means to construct, restore, or repair. Is established means to make secure or make ready. Are filled means to full or fill. So, that's quite straightforward. And then there are three key phrases in the proverb, by wisdom, by understanding, by knowledge. And if I was highlighting anything, those would be the three phrases I would be highlighting as I was doing my study. By wisdom, the Hebrew word for wisdom is chokma. It originates from God. It means something has originated from God and is rooted in Him. I love the NBC logo. You see it down there? See the roots? So that's what, that's what this by wisdom uh, word means. It means the ability to judge correctly and to follow the best course of action. It's seeing things God's way and making decisions that agree with His will and His word. And then that little phrase, by understanding, the Hebrew word for that is a butbunah, and the idea behind that word is that we must have a plan to build something. It also means to discern the process of construction. So understanding takes the wisdom of God and moves it into our decision-making process so that we act in a way that pleases God. Are you tracking with me? Doing, giving you a lot of sort of theological bits here up front, and then we're going to have a big ton of practical stuff. 
And then that little phrase, by knowledge, the Hebrew word for that is ubidat, and the root meaning of that word refers to the back and forth movement of the eye. So as I look back there and as I look back down to my notes over here, it's that kind of movement. And it implies a careful examination or scrutiny of the whole. In the context of this proverb, it's the technical or specific ability to apply God's word to every situation in family life. You hearing that? Our job as Christian parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts and all the rest of family that I said this all includes is to apply God's word to every situation in family life. And then finally, note the closing words there, with all precious and pleasant riches. I like in the English language the reiteration of those two P words, precious, pleasant. Now, while the phrase could mean that the rooms of a home will be filled with fine furniture and attractive draperies, it more likely symbolizes blessings of harmony and unity and loving family relationships and safety and protection and well-being and stability. So the main point of the proverb is that we need wisdom understanding and knowledge from God to build a home. Now, I know there's a lot of Baptists in the house, but I could have got an amen for that one. <laughs> Where are the Pentecostals when you need them? <laughs> so putting all these interpretive considerations together, here's my paraphrase of the proverb. It'll be up on the screen. By seeing things God's way, a family is constructed and with discernment made secure. A home is filled with God's blessings by applying God's word to every situation. So that's the proverb. What are the implications of what we've just unpacked there? Well, here they are. When, when I was a younger preacher, I used to love alliterating points. So I've got six L points for you, six verbs that start with L to hopefully be something to hang your memorization on. So the first one is this, live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. Building a Christian home begins with a commitment to live for Jesus. If your home is going to be everything God planned for it to be, you must acknowledge and accept as true that you and your family need Him. Got an amen there. This is so good. Give this lady seconds at lunchtime. <laughs> Do you love the Lord with all your heart and soul and strength and mind? Are you practicing the presence of God in your daily lives? Are you filled with His Spirit and exercising faith in what you say and do? Listen. The most crucial element in constructing a family is nurturing a relationship with Jesus. Is Jesus the unseen master of your home? If your children are going to open their hearts to Jesus, they must see you and me opening our hearts to Him. Only when we have a genuine connection with Jesus will we have something of value to share with our children. This is crucial. For me, this is Christian Family 101. God's plan is for parents to make Christ's character 
visible by matching and modeling it daily. Philippians 2. Are you doing this? Are the things you living for worthy of the things Christ died for? The foundation, foundations are what it's all about. My son-in-law has got his own construction company. Man, if that foundation is wrong, he's in trouble. The foundation for a Christian home is a commitment to live only and always for Jesus. Secondly, we've got to live for Jesus, and you've got to love your spouse. A healthy marriage is part of God's plan for building a Christian home. When a husband and wife love and respect each other, their relationship is a source of security for their children. One of the sadnesses for me is I have a neighbor where the husband and wife have recently separated, and I've watched it playing out with the, with the children, all the naughty things they're getting up to in the neighborhood. Because there's no secure mom and dad anymore. Heartbreaking. When children feel secure, they'll likely want to have a faith like their parents. And the converse is also true. When children don't see their parents in a loving relationship, their faith formation can be hampered. Now, I'm not saying these things lightly. I recognize we live in a broken world and we are broken people and there are all sorts of struggles. But I have to tell you what what the Word of God says we need to aspire to. How's your marriage doing? Do your children see you as we read in Ephesians 5 and verse 21, submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ. When you love your spouse, you create a more conducive environment for fostering faith in the home. If you're sitting next to your spouse, take their hand. I'll have to do it virtually with Karen. (laughs) She's at the back there. There she is. I couldn't see her. Okay, now give three squeezes. Karen and I have been doing this for years. It will often be somewhere like this, and one of us will just reach over to the other one. I love you. We don't have to say anything. Isn't that cool? You never thought you were going to come here and be saying, have a little romantic moment with your (laughs) spouse. I love you. And there's some of you sitting here like a past colleague of mine, Jenna, and she's thinking, oh, I wish Ben was here. I could have told him I loved him. I like the scripture in Malachi 2 and verse 15. One that one doesn't often think of when it comes to family. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in the Spirit. As I was reflecting on this verse this morning when I got up, I double underlined it in my thinking and underlined it in my notes. Guard yourself, husband, guard yourself, wife, in the spirit. And what does that mean? The rest of the verse tells us, and let none of you be faithless 
to the wife, and we could add there, or to the husband of your youth, to the person you married. Be faithful to one another. So to build a Christian home, you must live for Jesus. You must love your spouse. Each of these could be their own message, couldn't they? Thirdly, listen to each other. I continue to marvel at how the Spirit of God puts things together. When I walked down here this morning to bring my PowerPoint slides to, and thank you to our our two young men who serve in the back there looking after all the technology for us. Yeah, there we go. But just as I was walking in, a gentleman says to me, he says, oh, Lawson, and he opens his Bible, he says, I've got this for you, and he hands me this. And on this side, it says, listen, and he's got little numbers under there, three, two, one, six, four, five, under each of the letters for listen. And I'm getting my glasses out because I couldn't really see what was going on, and he said, yeah, he said, I used to teach my students that listen, and then he turned over to the other side. He said, if you rearrange the letters, spell silent. I said to him, one of my points today is on listening to each other. So wives, you need to be silent sometimes. (laughs) I'm in trouble, aren't I? I didn't mention the men. Both of us, male and female, there are times when we've got to stop talking. But not just between husbands and wives, two-way communication is crucial for building a, a, a Christian home, and it's crucial that it happens with our children as well. See, children may not listen to what we say about Jesus if we don't listen to them. You may be hearing your children, but are you listening? Active listening beyond simply hearing your children's words and observing what verbal and non-verbal messages may be sent is essential for family faith formation. So listen with attentiveness and empathy Listen to know and understand. Listen like a blind person has to listen when they have to cross a busy street. And listen, and this can be more difficult, not to judge or condemn, but to rightly direct and encourage your children in the way of the Lord. And as I say all of that, I think of this, Karen and I uh, spent two weeks, just a few weeks ago, on holiday on the East Coast. We stopped on the Cabot Trail to have lunch. There was a family sitting in this restaurant in the corner. There was a mum and dad, and I think they had three or four children. Every single one of them were looking at this. Every one of them, Karen pointed that out to me. It doesn't just happen out in the restaurant. We are sometimes so engaged in this through the course of the day, we are not connecting anymore with one another. Can't listen if this is getting in the way all the time. To build a Christian home, then... You must live for Jesus, you must love your spouse, we need to listen to each other, which sometimes means shutting down technology, and then fourthly, we need to lead wisely, lead wisely. Christian parenting is tricky because it requires you to be both hands-on and hands off. 
and to have the discernment to know when to be hands-on and when to be hands-off. And a spiritually discerning parent knows when to act and when not to get in the way of what the Holy Spirit is doing. It's good and right to set non-negotiable biblical boundaries for your children, to teach Christian values and beliefs and to do that clearly, and to establish transformational goals for your family. But do it wisely. Do it with much consideration. Do it in consultation with mature believers. Yes, children require boundaries and guidelines, but we can't look to rules to do what only God's grace can do. I need you to hear that, so I'm going to repeat that. We can't look to rules to do what only God's grace can do. This evening I'm going to be comparing, so it's not a biblical exposition tonight, I'm going to be comparing my generation of parenting, baby boomers, with how millennials are parenting, how their children are now parenting. And my generation tended to be quite legalistic. You do it because I say so. And we're not discussing this. And this is how it is. In fact, I remember looking at a photograph of my wife when she was a little girl, and she's hanging in a swing upside down, but she's got a dress on. And I'm going, why don't you have play pants on? No, in her family, at that stage of her family life, it changed later. Little girls wore dresses. It was legalistic. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. The greatest threat to your family isn't evil in the world, it's the sin in our hearts. And one of the most sinister things in your children's lives is their blindness to the depth of their spiritual needs. So don't insert yourself as an informant between what God is doing with your children and how your children need to learn to listen and respond to Him. And don't do anything that would hinder your children from becoming increasingly aware of God's presence and encountering Jesus directly. For the parenting battle, and yes, there's lots of joy in parenting, but it's a battle too, Isn't the behavior or attitude of our children, it's fighting for who will rule their hearts. So we need to live for Jesus, love your spouse, listen to each other, lead wisely, and fifthly, labor in prayer. Now for those of you who aren't a mom or dad, This is a huge one where you can contribute to the well-being of the family. Prayer, especially prayer informed by God's Word, fuels faith. So we need to pray the Scriptures and teach our children how to use them to guide, shape, and give language to their conversations with God. And we need to make sure that prayer isn't a hurried affair, that it's not just an add-on. We need to incorporate prayer into the daily quiet times that we have as a family, into our studying and contemplation in the Word of God, into listening for thoughts and direction from the Holy Spirit, and so on. My namesake from my same clan, I'm I'm Scottish background, Andrew Murray, the revivalist, said, and I quote, prayer is not a monologue, but dialogue. I had an article in Christian Parenting Basics, a blog that I write every two weeks, which is free, by the way, you can download that, simply called Christian Parenting Basics. 
and I did a whole thing on prayer, but I did a whole section on just chatting with God, how to teach your children how to chat with God. It's a conversation. Building a Christian home is about you, but not about you. The part that's not about you is the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit that forms your family's faith. The part that is about you is telling your children about Jesus in a way that helps them love and live for Him. So to see the work of God's Spirit at work in your family, you must constantly, so this is your bit in prayer now, you must constantly ask the Lord to inform and transform you and your spouse and your children. You need to be on your knees. You need to be seeking Him. And to help you disciple your children, you need to pray unceasingly for wisdom and understanding and knowledge and strength. You have not because you ask not. Never think you can go it alone. You may not think you do, but you desperately need God's help. There isn't a single moment in the day when you can manage without Him. Listen, constructing a family is participating. Here's one of my definitions of what it is to be family. It's participating in a divine activity. God's the architect, the engineer, and the contractor when it comes to building a family. He's in charge, not you. Your job is to join together, to share, to contribute, and cooperate with God's plans and purposes for your family, not your plans and purposes. Are you tracking with me? Now, the more I've thought about this, the more I've come to realize that if any parent had the power to create resilient faith in their children, Jesus didn't need to come. His life, His death, His resurrection and ascension and return are clear evidence that no single human can do what needs to be done for our families. One of the pastors and writers, authors who says a whole lot about this, and I find a lot of what he writes a tremendous blessing and hugely helpful, is Paul Tripp. He says this, and I quote, the more you pray, the more you confess your limits, the more you rest in God's power, the more you'll be freed from the temptation to do in and for your children what only God can do. Six. Number six. You're tracking with all these wonderful L points. They go with Lawson. <laughs> Number six. Link together. You can't build a Christian home without other people. This point flies in the face of 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 us Canadians, where our home is our fortress, we're going to do it. It's not the biblical way, though. You need help. I love what Pastor Rick Warren from Saddleback Community Church down in California says. We are better together. So who do you partner with? Your first choice, mums and dads, should be your Christian mums and dads, grandparents, local churches. Some of you are local church leaders. 
your greatest untapped asset in your church are your seniors for family ministry. Christian friends and relatives should also be consulted. Rope in those uncles and aunts. And then there's the members of your church congregation. For those of you that are parents here today, when you get back to your local church, have a look around. Sit there the next Sunday service you're in there and look around and say, hmm, I wonder who could be helping me here. There's people there that God has placed there already for you. I'll give you a clue, a little tip as to who specifically you might want to look for. They have a little title. They're called Empty Nesters. <laughs> They've been there, done that. They're a storehouse of knowledge and experience for you as a mum and dad. You can tap into that. So humble yourself and seek help. Admit your powerlessness. And I have to admit, as I say this, I did not do this well when I was a young dad. I could have been a much better parent, but now that I've had the advantage of, they say 2020 is hindsight, right? Recognize that building a Christian home is being okay with your limitations. I was wondering how to wrap up this message. I used to write a little bit of poetry years back, and so I, I thought, I'll try and do a little poem. I don't think it's very good, but it sort of captures some of the, it, it isn't good. <laughs> but it sort of captures some of the points, and it sort of rhymes. Here we go. Lord, who are we to build a home without you with us? We're all alone. And self-reliance leaves you relatively unknown. We make our plans, though little we may know, how weak our efforts, how feeble what we sow. Forgive us, Lord, for a trust that's low. Now hear our prayer for wisdom to will and do, for understanding and knowledge that's biblically true. Despite parenting shortcomings, more than a few. And help us teach our children you to find thanks for a grace, Lord, that's sufficient, never declined. May our love for Jesus not lag behind. Lord, for a Christian family, we'd faithfully be. Please let our friends and relatives see. As for me and my house, with you, Jesus, we agree. Amen. Father God, we thank you so much for, for the Proverbs. We thank you for the practical advice that is, is sown through your word. We thank you for your word for us this morning. We pray, Father, that whatever that piece is that you wanted to imprint on on each family, and we know it'll be different for every family here. Pray, Father, that we will take that, that we'll safeguard it, and we'll act on it. Help each family, Lord, help each parent here, he, help each grandparent, help the uncles and aunts and, and friends of the family, help the local church. Help us all, Lord, to be Nike Christians, to just do it. And those things that we've learned this morning, help us, Lord, to just do it. That's our simple prayer. 
We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust this sermon was an encouragement to you. We have various other resources available as well, including activities and retreats throughout the year that are designed to focus on growing resilient, biblically rooted families. Check out our website at muskokabible.com.